This is Dan Schneider, and on this Dan Schneider video interview, I will be talking with a man named Tom Sunick about the life and career and ideas of Oswald Spengler, a noted historian, and that will be occurring in just a moment. Well, as I mentioned, this show, I will be talking with an expert on the life of Oswald Spengler, a noted historian uh, of almost a century ago. Uh, his name is Tom Sunick, and you see him on your screen. Uh, and so welcome, Tom. Hello, everybody. Thanks for your invitation. I appreciate being here, and I'm at your service. Well, I wanted to talk, uh, as I said, a little bit about Oswald Spengler, but before uh, we get into sort of uh, a background about his life and ideas just for this first segment, I, I'd i like you to just uh, talk a little bit about who you are. Uh, are you a historian? Uh, are you a researcher? What books you have and what your interest in Oswald Spengler is? So if you could give us a little bit, three, four, five minutes background on yourself. Well, uh, first and foremost, I'm a U.S. citizen, but I was born in Croatia, in ex-communist Yugoslavia, so I have a communist experience in my mindset as well, and a capitalist experience of the United States of America and Western Europe, where I also studied. So this certainly facilitates my understanding of Oswald Spengler, who was critical of both liberalism, or let's put it bluntly, of capitalism, and of communism. And uh, I, I actually, I, I, in my undergraduate work here back in communist Yugoslavia, I studied foreign language and literature in Europe, in Western Europe, in France for some times as well. And then I moved to the United States of America where I obtained political asylum based on the fact that my old man, my dad, was a lawyer, a Catholic lawyer in communist Yugoslavia who was arrested for his uh, very politically incorrect beliefs. He was a prominent uh, adversary of the communist system back uh, during the Cold War. It's a pretty long story as far as my dad is concerned. So anyway, he's now old. He's now he's old, already, already dead a long time ago. So in uh, the United States of America, I obtained my PhD at the University of California in political science. Now, having said this, I must say I, I don't like using this word expert because there is something self-serving about this word. I just consider myself an avid reader, an avid truth seeker, to some extent also a heretic, a dissident if you wish, and I certainly like, I'm always open to different intellectual challenges, and I like reading, and I certainly am very much focused on literature, so I feel comfortable talking about Spengler just as much as I feel talking, I feel comfortable talking about Greek classics like Sophocles or, or or others. And uh, I've been dealing with different sorts of uh, subjects and topics, and I'm frequently a, a guest speaker at different places in Europe and the United States of America. And I'm not ruling out that I may be relocating soon back to the States and starting or restarting or rejumping again my, my teaching career because I miss my students. Yes, I need to tell you that. There was a little parenthesis I needed to add. One of the reasons I came here to Yugoslavia, and I rather uh, I left Yugoslavia, but then I returned back to Croatia because I was pretty much active as a high, as a diplomat in a Croatian Foreign Service and as a diplomat. So I was stationed in Belgium and Copenhagen and also in Algiers for, for a while. So it certainly gave me a, a an additional perspective of this human drama that we call the that to some extent, if you look at the portion of it in the, in the West, we call it the decline of the West. And I guess that's much about this. I guess my books speak better than I, as far as uh, I'm concerned. So feel free to look at my prose. I guess everybody has his ID, just like you do, and some of your listeners. And I guess I'm proud to say that my ID are my books published in the English and uh, German and the French languages. Well, just so uh, people know who are watching this, uh, below this video, uh, you will see a link to Tom's website. It's tomsunic.com. Uh, so you'll be able to look over his website and he has essays and writings in multiple languages. So uh, thanks. Uh, let me uh, let me talk uh, a, a bit about uh, Oswald Spengler then. Um, 
Well, let's let, let's talk. Uh, what actually drew you to his work, his his outlook as as a, a layman myself? When I got out of high school back thirty years or so ago, I know I read Decline of the West, and uh, uh, it was for me a very interesting book. And I've always felt that it was very uh, misrepresented. Uh, Spengler often gets lumped in with Nietzsche as a sort of proto-Nazi, and I don't recall. And again, it's been thirty some years since I read the book in full, but I never, I never really found his ideas to be that repugnant or anything. But he seems to have always been a tard with a bad reputation by other uh, people, you know, in, in history, historians and, and whatnot. Um, what drew you to Spengler and what kind of myths can you maybe dispel about his reputation as a thinker? Sure. Well, it's a, it's a huge topic. Well, let, let me start from what you just said a while ago. I'm very keen as a linguist to some extent. I'm very keen about the right meaning of, of words. And I'm almost obsessed, I could put it that way, with semantic distortions and but this is the better expression. So when you say that, when, when some people say, when some folks argue that, uh, that Spengler was a proto-Nazi or something, this is a wrong wording to start with. Actually, he was very much opposed to National Socialism. And secondly, and I guess I could spend an hour just talking about this uh, derivative, this word derivative, National Socialism. I guess it's a better word than the Nazism. We have to know exactly what that means uh, and what that meant during his epoch. Uh, also, Spengler died in 1936. There is no question he had a meeting with, uh, actually, Hitler in 1933, uh, call him a, a private, for a private discussion, because there is no question that in, National Socialist authorities, I'm talking specifically about cultural academic authorities, wanted to uh, enlist and actually uh, harness to some extent his intellectual prestige, or Spengler's prestige, into their own ideological bandwagon. Well, he was probably lucky because he died a couple of years later, in 1936 he died. Now, as far as, uh, you know, I'm very keen again, I must say, about those um, name throwing. and. He was definitely a, a, a sympathizer, he was to some extent a fan of, of Mussolini, but he rejected National Socialism and even many leftists or whatever that means, or many liberal scholars do hold him is in high esteem. Those who don't, those who actually um, tamper with his names, uh, name are usually those who haven't read anything by him or who probably just read some short summaries and synopsis of, on his life. Now, again, uh, this is like an introductory <laughs> form. Let me now start with the basics, if I may. Uh, I must say, I guess, uh, on an explanatory level, we read, and I'm sure you, you, Dan, you, you read the stuff. We have to read the stuff, either the one that is dished out to us, that we have to read. This is a mandatory reading, like in our high school. We have on the reading list the books that you simply have to read. But there are also certain books that you feel sort of a, you have an inclination, you have a penchant, you have a, a certain hidden um, interest for some of the authors. And of course, I must say, when I was a boy, when I was in high school, and even later on here in communist Yugoslavia, I barely knew who Oswald Spengler was. Well, his books were translated. They had been translated a long time ago, back in the old Yugoslavia in the early 20s. But he was simply not a, on the reading list. He was not a, a guy worth uh, any, any PR attention at that epoch, at that time. And neither was he very popular in a, in a Federal Republic of Germany, nor was he popular in the United States of America in the 50s, 60s, or 70s, other than in some quote-unquote conservative circles. I must make another digression. Why do I use the word quote-unquote or alleged? Why do I use the adjective um, would be or, or, or purported or what have you? Simply because I'm scared of those words. I'm scared that at the same time I despise some of those words. I don't like name-calling. I don't like calling people names that they don't deserve. So probably the name uh, Oswald Spengler deserves is cultural pessimist. This is probably the word that the best expression that, that fits uh, that uh, that. Uh, um, 
describes uh, Spengler best. Now back to my interest uh, for Spengler. I actually developed interest for Spengler uh, when I was in my late twenties, when I was able enough uh, to read the, the German, you know, the, the Ger his German text in the original, and I'm proud of it, of course, because it's an entirely different ball game when you read uh, uh, also Spengler in the English translation, which is very good, by the by, and also the French translation is very good. But it's an entirely different rhapsody, <laughs> blue rhapsody, when you read the Spengler in its original, because of the richness of the German language and so on. And again, I think I need to spend some time just explaining the title of this book that you all, we all read. I presume, Dan, you also read the book when you were much younger, yeah. the, Unter, uh, the, the Decline of the West. First, the Untergang is the right German word that was translated into English by the decline. Now, the Untergang in the German language, I'm sorry to bother you with that, but it's quite important. It's not exactly the, the right replica, the English replica of the German word the Untergang. The Untergang means like a, like a decay, like a, something falling apart. It's not just like the decline. Decline is a process. You know? Like the Untergang is almost the finished process. Mm. So I guess there is a, a slight difference in time frame. So I prefer this that Untergang. It sounds, you know, it has a certain tonality, it has a certain rhythm, but at the, tame, the same time, it has a somewhat nuanced significance, which is certainly different than the English significance to decline. Oh, Tom, Tom, let me just ask you, would, a, would an English word like aftermath be more applicable, do you think? Because as, as I recall, and just in looking up uh, some notes, uh, it always seemed to me that, that Spengler was, was not so much mourning things, but looking ahead towards a new world. And so he was sort of looking back, you know, from as if that had already passed in a sense or was about to pass. So would aftermath, do you think, have been a better word choice? I don't quite think so. Let me tell you why. The Untergang, if I can just metaphorically explain it, the Untergang in the German, uh, in the German language, the German, German title, is something past. It's a past tense. It's finished past tense. Whereas the decline, in my understanding, when you use the word decline, decline, the French have decline, when you declinate the, the words, the nouns, <clears throat> it is a rather a process which is still with us, which is a past perfect tense. So I, if I were to choose a better uh, translation of his, uh, of his uh, um, major uh, book, of the, uh, the Clock of the West, I would probably prefer the word, uh, uh, it's a good point indeed, I've been thinking about this for years. <laughs> the decay might be good, but I'm trying to figure out the, a process, uh, a verbal, uh, of, uh, a, a, a noun which, which describes a past process of decay and which is no longer re retrievable, which is which can no longer be resuscitated back to life. This is exactly what the Untergang means, something which is finished over, over the decay, the end of the world, but cannot be resuscitated. Unlike what you just said, the aftermath, you know, the aftermath means <laughs> rather something that happens after. How about petrification? Well, that, you know, that's, thank you. That, that, that sounds much better. Of course, this may be a little bit, you know, Petrus, it comes from the Latin word pe uh, the stone, petrification, yeah. petrify, the stone, stonification, getting stoned. <laughs> I don't want to off, you know. <laughs> anyway, getting stoned with the past. But that petrification might be a better thing. Petrification, we actually, he talks about the petrified cultures when he talks about ancient cultures in the Middle East. He talks about as well. We have Persepolis, for instance, which he mentions. Then we have also, what's the name of the town? Uh, it was seized recently by the terrorists, the ISIS, in, in uh, uh, Petra, that's in Jordan. Anyway, it uh, just crossed my mind. I got lots of things you know, coming into my mind in different languages. So, anyway, so once again, the decline is, is a good, it's, it's a valid, it's a, an acceptable, feasible translation. But I'm still trying to think about something along the lines of the petrification of culture, as you then very well put. Now, this is not the end of the story. Hopefully, I'm not bothering you younger, you younger listeners. I would advise them, and I would certainly strongly urge them, if they have their professors, regardless whether they're undergraduate studies or graduate studies, please, folks, challenge your professor. Ask them. 
I asked them always who defines those words, who defines, be it in the justice and legal system, be it in sociology or political science, or whatever you study, just make sure you understand the, the right meaning of the word in its right time span, its time, right epoch, because otherwise folks will get into, you know, just be beating around the bush. Well, Tom, now, Tom, Tom, to the book a little bit more in our next segment. Let, if, if you can, can, can you give me a, a few minutes of just background about Spengler, where he came from, what part of Europe, the, the, the social background that he came from, the, the time that he appeared, and what may have formed the views, uh, his views? All right. Now, he was born in the late, uh, he was born in, at the end of the 19th century. And guys, keep in mind always that uh, this was a very specific epoch in, in the whole of Europe. You know, he was definitely a fan, if I can say, he was a disciple of Nietzsche. Nietzsche died in, in 19, 1900 exactly, so he was just born in, uh, in, 80, 80, in 1880. And his whole lifespan, he, he didn't last long. He died when he was 50. He was died in 1936, which means that he lived for 56 years. He died so a relatively young man. He had heart problems and he had some also anxiety problems and so on. So basically, he's a man, what the French call of the fin du siècle, of the end of the century. A very a turning century where we have the compound names such as Marx, Nietzsche, Darwin, um, Wilfredo Pareto, all those big names coming on the European intellectual horizon and which really, really shaped the entire intellectual climate in Europe in the first half, I must repeat it, in the first half of the 20th century. Without Spengler, you cannot think, you cannot even imagine the intellectual, uh, different intellectual uh, streams and currents in Europe and in the United States of America. Now he came from a rather frugal family. His dad was a uh, he was an engineer, but he uh, he retired later on, and he was born in the Hartz, which is which used to be the East Germany. So he lived a rather peaceful life, and and he wasn't politically active. Let me put that way, folks. And he was just an intellectual man, a man of staggering erudition in classics in different languages, and he spent his whole life literally, literally, not metaphorically, reading and studying. And of course, you know, of course, the first thing that comes to mind what happened during this crucial year in 1933. In 1933, he was not a Nazi member, but he definitely, he did, whether I like it or not, his ideas may have, let me put it conditionally, may have affected some currents, some currents in the National Socialist Movement, especially in terms of uh, his, uh, in terms of his uh, cultural pessimism, in terms of, and of course, in terms of his uh, sharp criticism, liberal system and a Marxist system. Now, again, I mentioned earlier that he had a short meeting, well, an hour and a half meeting with, with Hitler, despite the fact that he published just a year earlier, this was in 1932, he published his last book, which I think is a good compendium, and I would definitely suggest to most of your listeners to read this book, even prior to reading the book on the decline of the West. And this book's name is The Hours of, the Dec or the Hours of Decision. Again, we have a problem with the title. Because the title in the, in the German language is the years of decision. And the book was translated the hours of decision in the English language. I don't know why, literally. So it's like a short compendium of his earlier works in which he basically lays out his uh, criticism of liberalism, modernity, progress, and of course, all different mass movements. And despite all of this, I must stress this, despite all of this, Many national socialist circles, including Hitler himself, didn't mind, you know, paying him a visit, and you know, so I guess it sort of casts a different light on all those stories and and, uh, and narratives that we hear about uh, Hitler, or for that matter, national socialist and Spengler. He was a scholar, and he was, as I said, he was uh, somewhat sympathetic to Mussolini and to fascism. But this was quite different from, from his views on National Socialism, which he to some extent despised because of its massification and because of its optimism, which certainly he was opposed to. Now, no. let, let me just ask you, Tom. Um, so uh, what is, have, have any major biographies been done of Spengler's life? And if so, well, have, has anyone, uh, what was sort of the genesis of his world outlook, would you say? Has any has there been a consensus on that? Yes, the first. Okay, let me let me uh, let, let me first try to stay value neutral. Okay, uh, we cannot imagine uh, Oswald Spengler 
without first without having in mind Friedrich Nietzsche and uh, and Goethe. In fact, in his dedication in the first uh, the first edition of his book, the Untergang des uh, the Decline of the West, he specifically refers in his first in the first page to Goethe, Wolfgang Goethe, a great uh, uh, German poet and dramatist, and Friedrich Nietzsche. So again. Again, we have to situate him, we have to situate Oswald Spenger in the right epoch, in the right time frame. And I guess that did explain very, very much. Just like we cannot imagine many, many subsequent authors, and even his, uh, how can I say, bibliographers who were fond of him, including the, the American scholar and uh, um, uh, uh, he, uh, he, uh, just a second. It's on the tip of my tongue, it will come. And uh, who, who, who definitely had, uh, uh, were definitely influenced by, by Nietzsche's prose. So is that the question you asked me? I just want to be quite specific. Yes, Nietzsche was the product of the late 19th century, specifically Nietzsche, of German idealism. And of course, uh, Spengler, in turn, influenced great, great many thinkers, not just in, in, in Europe, but also in the United States of America, thinkers who, quote, are usually associated with the word cultural conservatives. Even Pat Buchanan, if you wish, quotes him at some place, uh, uh, <coughs> Nozick and other authors, and uh, many other conservatives from um, Chronicles of American Culture I'm familiar with. Well, basically, all conservative scholars in, in, uh, in, uh, in the United States of America at some point referred to him or either by paraphrasing him or citing or quoting directly from his work. All right. Well, um, let's uh, uh, take a break and end this segment. When we get back in our next major segment, let's talk about the decline of the West, the major work that he's known for. We'll get to some of his later works in a, in a later segment. But in the next segment, let's focus on the decline of the West, when it was published, uh, the, the, the major ideas about cultures, about decay, about uh, cycles in history, etc. And uh, we'll do that in a moment. Well, Tom, uh, I want to focus in this segment on uh, the most notable uh, work or the most famous work in Spengler's uh, bibliography, and that, of course, is the Untergang or the Decline of the West. And I wanted to focus uh, a bit on uh, what prompted the book, number one, uh, and then the content, things such as uh, the distinctions that he made between a culture and a civilization, so, which was sort of like the becoming and what results from it, uh, his ideas on, uh, I think there were uh, the Apollonian cultures, Faustian cultures, the different types of cultures, and all of that kind of thing that he's most noted for. So um, let me just ask from the beginning, what prompted him uh, to write this work uh, initially? Was it, uh, the, was it a p particular thing that he'd worked on for many years, or, or is, is it known as what really, really gave him the impetus to, to write a book in this vein? On the intellectual level, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, Spengler was uh, an avid disciple of Friedrich Nietzsche. And Friedrich Nietzsche he certainly can be ranked into this category of cultural pessimism as well. And uh, as a result of this, as a result of his avid reading of Nietzsche, he felt compelled, in a way, to uh, sketch out the broader I'll call it the biology of history because this is this is probably the best uh, uh, explanation for for his work, the biology of history, in which basically he studies uh, the decline of histories uh, by comparing them to trees, to petals, to different plants, how they grow and how they eventually decay. As a result of this just of this biological process of growth and decay and death. So we can notice here right away a strong sense of, uh, of the tragic, which, is, uh, which was quite typical for many, many, literally hosts of German philosophers and thinkers, starting with Schopenhauer, by the way. For instance, I'm sorry again to back up, but we cannot study uh, Nietzsche unless we study Arthur Schopenhauer and his book, a very pessimistic book about uh, 
the perception of, of our reality and how people perceive the reality. So just as Nietzsche was influenced by Schopenhauer, so was Spengler influenced a hundred years later, actually after, after, after Nietzsche had already died, this was 20 years later, uh, he was influenced by, by, by Nietzsche. Uh, there was a strange coincidence in that book, and I need to stress that, I, I need to point, point, point to that. Uh, uh, the book was written, it was already not, not finished, but it was the, the, the major draft had already been written uh, prior to the First World War and during the First World War. The book came out only shortly after the First World War, and the results of the First World War for Germany only corroborate his earlier, let's say, prophecies of wishful thinking, we may say, that the world, and it's specifically the, the Western world, the Occident, the, the Abendland in German is Abendland, which is not exactly the West. Again, I'm sorry for those digressions, but the West is not the best translation for the German word as Abendland. Abendland is the, the land of the dying sun, of the, of the setting sun. Like in San Francisco, and uh, this Occident, uh, this uh, this trauma that was caused by the end of the First World War, this <clears throat> the turmoil in Germany in 1919, 1920, only gave further uh, further credence to his uh, popularity, and he was literally overnight during the Weimar Republic, he became one of the best the most read authors in, in Germany. And this trend continued well into the 20s and 30s and even after the Second World War. Now, this is a, a thick book, rather than two volumes of these books. And yes, indeed, as you mentioned a while ago, he talks about this. He uses the word the morphology of culture, and I presume that I think that the word the biology of culture would be better, in which he studies, of course, not just the... the, the uh, European cultures, but also different cultures, of, especially from the Middle East. Now, again, just before we proceed, uh, we need again to clarify another word, which is quite important. And in the English language, though, this this this, this is often forgotten. This is often skipped over, and 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 I mean specifically the word civilization versus uh, culture. These are two opposing and con contradictory concepts. They have nothing in common. They have, they have something in common, but not quite. In the United States of America, or for that matter, in Europe, we now use interchangeably the word culture and civilization. as a, We use them as a synonym. And uh, on, on many occasions, especially in his book, uh, uh, Decline of the West, he, he specifically, I have the citation exactly, I don't know exactly the page, but you can look at my website and, and the piece I published about 25 years ago on the history and, and decadence and cult, also Spengler and the decadence and history and decadence. It was in the clear journal. So and I'm quoting him. I'll try to, sum, I'll, I'll try to summarize it in a, a somewhat in a, in a rough language. So, uh, culture is basically something organic. It's spirit-oriented, it's soul-oriented, it comes from the heart, it comes from your passion, it comes from your thinking as well, and your ability of putting yourself in different historical perspective, and putting yourself in your own culture, in your own race, your own ethnicity in, in, in perspective. Whereas civilization, and he uses very much the word Americanismus, Americanism, when he talks about the civilization, and again, he was not anti-American, but he was quite critical of this mercantile or merchant culture in the United States of America. We'll come that, to that in a second. He actually uh, uh, assimilates, uh, associates, I'm sorry, associates the civilization with the rise of the mass man, with the rise of the, what we call now totalitarian system. He didn't use the word totalitarianism, but we can now use it with a totalitarian system. Again, the word system is much better than society. And he actually uh, uh, compares the civilization to unorganic, uh, that's the word he uses, now it's come back to my mind, unorganic life form, which is bound to decline. So if we can transpose now Spengler into our epoch, into our time, into this very present moment when we are talking to each other, we can say safely that we are, according to his words, according to his uh, vocabulary, that we are actually traversing, that we are actually going through this 
uh, end times of this technical civilization, which has become totally ruthless, totally immoral, totally decadent, totally out of out of off the wall, and which is declining at a very rapid pace. So it's just a matter of time, whether it's a years or decades or centuries before it falls apart. So this is specifically what he means by civilization. He was a great admirer of cultures, specific cultures, but he also realized that those cultures at some point in time, and now we're talking about past tense, they also ended up in civilization. So basically the civilization, once again, is a mortal enemy of culture. So we have a dual, <laughs> a very interesting um, form of, uh, how can I put it uh, in English, of, of, of contradictory, two, two contradictory concepts. You cannot have civilization, according to, to Spindler, unless you have culture. Yet at the same time, civilization is bound to decline. So yes, indeed, we can probably reproach him, we can tell him, we can accuse him, we can charge him with being a, a historical determinist, which to a large extent he was, according to many, many authors who, who wrote about him. Lukács wrote about him, Pat Buchanan mentions that also at some place, some other authors, uh, some, I mentioned that in some of my pieces about him. So yes, you can say that he was an uh, inveterate, you can say inveterate pessimist, in a sense that yes, we need culture, of course we need to be all cultivated and cultured, if I can put it somewhat more po in a popular fashion for younger listeners, and yet at the same time, you have, we have too much culture, we have the surplus of accumulation of culture, we end up in civilization, and with the civilization, look at the United States of America. We sign literally, not metaphoric, we will sign a death warrant. So that's an irony of history because he also talks about different cultures, just backpedaling if I can a little bit, uh, ancient Greece, ancient Babylonian cultures that all turn into fantastic and famous civilizations. But at some point, this, as he says, the rule of money, this uh, greed, or how can I put it in a more not in a less colloquial sense, this uh, materialistic uh, accumulation of capital, uh, it's probably not a good word, um, uh, this uh, obsession with the uh, material growth and material uh, material uh, wealth, uh, uh, turns the culture into civilization, and civilization then uh, almost is bound, is bound to collapse. Now, the, the interesting point, and I just need to go where I'm still there, is that he basically argues, and this is where he sounds a little bit too deterministic and probably maybe repulsive to some of our younger listeners, some, some, of the, some of the scholars as well, is that all cultures, without any exception, be it the American culture, German culture, French culture, are bound to go through those cycles, which is bound to, to end up in, in their self-destruction, okay? <laughs> Just roughly put. Well, uh, Tom, let me ask you, you mentioned uh, uh, his idea of sort of a biological... Uh, of, of civilization and culture as a biological process would you say do you think it would be it's been unfair to say that he was a pessimist because as I recall each each sort of flowering and then decay you know formed the loam for the next civilization to come so it seems to me that his idea of the decline of the West uh, by by the nature of his very argument uh, presaged the coming of a new culture. So that really wouldn't be pessimistic. It, it's just, you know, at that point in time, and if you are in the West, it might seem pessimistic. So it seems to me, as, as, as I recall, that uh, that seems a bit of a bum rap to give him because he's just sort of looking at it uh, from on high. And, you know, he almost had this sort of godlike view looking back down upon it, you know, uh, with, you know, over the centuries. Would that be fair to say that uh, that he he was uh, more detached and able to look at it uh, and 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 see this this turnover? Uh, you know, to call him a pessimist would be unfair. I fully agree with you, Dan. I must tell you, I myself I'm frequently puzzled, and hence the reason I don't want to now dish out my own value judgments about him. You are quite right. Look, after all death, you know, after each death, <laughs> there is a new rebirth. And uh, I guess uh, there is a new birth, there is a new, a new uh, something new springs back to life. Even look at yourself, I mean, we don't need to, to narrate now about ourselves, 
once we once we uh, once we die, once we pass out, uh, once we just vanish from from our from the earth, our and our descendants, our children, our uh, our prodigy, who will, our, our, sorry, our progenitor, will, the, our offsprings will take over. And I guess it's a good point that I just need to make a slight digression. This is exactly where National Socialist scholars, I mean official scholars, many of them racially oriented, I happen to be familiar with some of their works, where they actually attack him on this bum wrapping, as you said. How can you have a death of life? Of course, but there is something new coming up. Again, we can make the following argument, if you allow me. Like, I'm sure you hear, especially among many conservatives in the United States of America, I'm talking about cultural conservatives, I'm not talking, you know, about Republicans, so yeah. that's a bit okay. Uh, they talk, well, it's the end of the white race, well, this, and it, well, that's fine, but something new will then spring up. Now, here we got to be very careful. Whether this is going to be, whether this is going new, this new is going to be better or for worse, I can't tell you. This is a matter of weather judgment. The fact of the matter is that I may now, in hindsight, feel some nostalgia for, let's say, the old Greek culture. I may feel some romantic, uh, in hindsight, <coughs> nostalgia, excuse me, for Leonidas and his uh, Spartans who fought uh, against the Persians. I may also have some nostalgia, of, let's say, for all, you know, I am particularly a, a fan of Prince Eugene of the 17th century, who actually cleared up the terrain, who kicked out the Turks of Central Europe and where I live, you know, Prince Eugene and with his volunteers from all parts of Europe, he kicked out the, not just the Muslims, the Turks out of Europe completely. But uh, again, to what extent this no nostalgia can square off now with my present wishful thinking, I can't tell you. It's just a matter of philosophical speculation. Whether the United States of America, let me take a wild guess and I don't want to harp on this, but I need to mention it. Whether America, let's say 20 years or 30 years down the road, when this demographic uh, profile will have changed, will be a better place to live. Well, probably yes for some, but probably not for some other folks. So again, now we are again in this Nietzschean dilemma. What is good and what is bad? It may be good for some people, but it may be bad for some other folks. So you are quite right. <coughs> he is a cultural pessimist, although I'm quite certain if he was alive now, he would, he would argue with us. He would tell Tom and Dan, no, I'm not a cultural pessimist, I'm just stating the obvious. Yeah. So I guess it's just a matter of wording, and I, I'm sorry I can't, I can't read his mind. I only one thing I know for sure because I read about him because I guess I feel certainly attracted to him because I usually read authors that are also close to my own temperament and my own psyche, my own uh, cognition, if I can put it somewhat more eloquently. He was a very anxiety-prone man. He was sort of a uh, already he, he was leaning again uh, towards this uh, cultural pessimism, like many of us do. There's no question about. But his self-description is certainly different from the description of the subsequent critics and authors of him. Wow, I got a little bit entangled in this wordings, but I'm sure you can follow the thread of my thought and some of your listeners. I hope they can follow me. Well, Tom, let me, let me just ask you then. Uh, uh, <coughs> let, let's talk about his ideas of types of civilization, because... Uh, the, he talked about Apollonian, Magian, Faustian civilizations, and uh, I, I want to talk about that. And since he thought the West was declining, did he have any ideas about what coming civilization might be like? So yes. let's talk about the three major types of civilizations that he defined and what he thought was coming in the future. So if you could just give a, a brief definition on, on those types. Apollonian uh, civilization, I'm sure folks are familiar with Apollo. Yeah. It was uh, one of the prime gods in ancient Greece, in the old mythical Greece, of course. He stood for beauty, for, he stood really for beauty, for, we can call it aestheticism. I don't think this word exists. I've, I've seen it in the English language, although it's not being used quite often. He stood for the form, for the gestalt, what the Germans say, for Certainly something completely different from decadence, you know, from a formless and abstract society in which we live today. <coughs> and of course, uh, uh, Spengler, just like Nietzsche, Nietzsche talks about the Apollonian culture, the Dionysian culture very much. Again, keep in mind, if you read Spengler, guys, please take a book by Nietzsche as well 
and beat the birth tra the tragedy by Nietzsche because it's a, it's a valuable secondary book in, in, in order to refer to your knowledge of Spengler. I hate to say that, folks, but you can't just read Spengler out of the context. you got to put him in the right... <coughs> Excuse me, I got this cough. You have to put him in the right context, folks, if you want to understand him. He's definitely Nietzsche number two. Uh, that's what Spengler was all about. So Apollonian culture was a, a culture of beauty, culture of, of, of nicety, culture of forms which, of course, is completely opposed to our modern culture, which is not even a culture, which is a, a decadent uh, civilization. Then we have a Dionysian culture. Of course, Dionysian culture is something very interesting. You will find it all over in the, among Greek classics, folks. It's something inseparable from the Greek life. Again, <clears throat> I hate to use the word uh, cultural pessimism when describing, uh, let's say, Sophocles or for Aeschylus or, or other classical uh, uh, Greek authors. There was, I would say that there were people who had a very pronounced sense of the tragic. And of course, they, they knew that they were going to die, they knew that they were going to uh, vanish. But at the same time, they also cherished their life. They were not cultural pessimists, as you know, some suicidal authors would probably <laughs> suggest. They enjoyed life almost sometimes to their extreme. And this is what we call the Dionysian culture. Nietzsche explains it very well, just like Spengler. In a sense that, you know, uh, you have to, you know, have to wine and dine, if I can put it that way. I mean, we have those Dionysian uh, uh, celebrities and uh, celebrations all over Greece, in ancient Greece, in the 4th, 5th century before Jesus Christ. And, uh, of course, the only problem is with the bounds of those, of those Dionysian cultures. Once they get off the, off the, uh, off the board, then they become self-destructive, of course. And then what's a certain of the greatest interest for all of us is this Faustian, the Faustian culture, which he spends most of the time talking about, which is basically the Western culture, the Faustian culture. We can possibly also call it the Promethean culture, because I often, in my own works, in my own essays, including the last one, the, the latest one that I published recently, uh, I often compare Faust or Faust with the Prometheus. Prometheus, as a certain know, was a titan. He was not a god. He is ranked as a, as a god in ancient literature. He was a man, or actually a titan, a deity, who had given fire to the mankind, who actually created the man and mankind. But he was such a dissident, he was such a heretic, so he got into a brawl. He got into a fight with Zeus, with the big god, if I can put it somewhat simplistically. <coughs> and then for that, he had to pay the price. So he was not a very politically correct God or Titan during that time. But he was a man of exceptional, exceptional uh, driving uh, how can I say, energy. And this is something very, very typical, and I need to specify this is very typical of European peoples. Now we can say white race, this hyper individualism, hyper, uh, hyper uh, knowledge, and always striving to surpass himself. And unfortunately, we know when we want to surpass ourselves, sometimes things can get very nasty, not just for the others, but also for ourselves. And this is the problem also we encountered with the Faustian culture. I use interchangeably, in my own wording at least, Faust and Prometheus, Faustian culture and Promethean culture. Again, let's, let's just come to, uh, let's, let's return to the definition of the word Faust. Faust, folks, I'm sure you're familiar with. I, I mentioned a while ago that uh, uh, Spinner was influenced by by Nietzsche and by, by Schopenhauer, but he was also influenced by one of probably the greatest European author, Wolfgang Goethe, who wrote his book, a very good translation in English, on Faust. The Faust was a young man, a man who literally, who had read so many books, but he's always unhappy. He has everything in his life, whatever he can think of he has, but he's unhappy because he would like to reach the unreachable. This is exactly, this is the prime example of the Faustian or Promethean culture. And this is something very typical. I hate to say that this is not an ethnic, but yes, we can say an ethnic quality or rather <laughs> disquality of European peoples. We always want to reach ourselves. Here is the best example on a geopolitical level, if I may, guys, just throw this at you, of a Faustian spirit. Young, let's say, Englishmen or young Scots or young Irish, let's say, in the 17th, 18th, 18th century and traveling all the way down to Tasmania or traveling all the way down to Utah. <laughs> Can you imagine? Those folks didn't even know where they were going. They were just going because they had this spirit. 
the spirit of conquest, the spirit of, of Promethean spirit of surpassing themselves. We no longer have the spirit, folks. It's over. So this is exactly what uh, what Spengler uh, says in his culture. Energy that we find among most European people, especially among the English and the, the German people as well, although he makes a difference between the English people and the German, Germanic people, uh, just as much as it can be a, a, a good fuel for intellectual energy, for our scientific energy, can also turn into a uh, our deadly, uh, our, the mirror image of our, our, of our deadly embrace. Look at the atomic weapons, look what's going on in Europe, look what's going on along the world, among, specifically among European peoples, who are the worst enemies towards themselves, not towards other peoples. And also Spengler talks about this. So I must sell it on a, pers on a personal level, folks, uh, just as much as I'm often um, categorized as a right wing or whatever that means, some of the worst enemies I have are my own people, I must tell you that, precisely because of this Promethean or false Promethean energy that fuels and energizes those people and sometimes makes them adopt strategies which are detrimental not just to other peoples but also to themselves. Again, just to sum up, Faustian and Promethean is more or less the synonym for this, uh, what's the, what, how can I put it more descriptively, for this energy driven culture which is a very typical, which is a hallmark of, of Europeans, of white Europeans. Well, Tom, uh, let me ask you then, what uh, was the basic uh, uh, surmise? How, how did uh, Spengler end his book? And what was his basic uh, thesis and prescription going forward? And did he have a view of a, what a coming civilization that would rise from the ashes of the West might be? Yes, well, actually, he expands on that a little bit more in this his latest book. Actually, as far as the Untergang des Abendlandes, as far as the decline of the Western Spring, it's a rather pessimistic work. And he's very pessimistic about the future of the West. And, uh, and uh, there, there's nothing, there's no hope, there's no glimmer of hope in this book. However, in his... Uh, uh, in his later work, in this late, latest book, he may sound a little bit contradictory because he specifically mentions on some, in some parts of this book uh, the years of decision, oh, I'm sorry, the hours of decision <clears throat> that um, life is a fight, yes, so I'll try to, folks, don't, don't misquote me, and I, I hope I'm not going to misquote him. Life is a permanent battle, roughly, <laughs> yes, or life is a permanent battle, and uh, whoever seeds, whoever gives up, will be overrun by, by lower forms of life. I don't want to say that he was a racist because he never uses, he never uh, mentions any, he, ne he never uses racial slurs in his books, far from it, folks. But he is definitely aware of the fact that if, uh, if whites, and you know, where he talks specifically about whites, and he's quite critical of white pacifists and talking to, so this is the book, keep in mind, was published just a year before the National Socialists came to power, but which was not banned, the book was not banned during the National Socialist uh, period of, of time. <clears throat> and his book, he says quite openly, if you, if you give up, if you, if you think that you're going to uh, disarm your opponents by pacifistic preaching, you will certainly not, uh, you will not disarm them, <laughs> quite to the contrary, you will spur them into attacking you and robbing you and raping you and uh, uh, taking over. I guess to some extent we can say he's right, because this is on a personal level where I disagree with many pacifists who argue, well, let's just have a unilateral disarmament, let's just bail out of, uh, let's just pull our troops from uh, the crowd in Nicaragua, where I'm at, I'm still in the spring there, and, uh, from Afghanistan, or pull out the troops of, uh, of where Philippines or Europe, whatever, and peace will prevail. No way, folks. It doesn't work. And this is exactly what Spengler, this is, uh, Spengler argues throughout this whole book. You, know? you give up with your pious preaching, it will certainly not be a guarantee of success. It will be taken over, he says quite explicitly in his book, um, and the last one that I already mentioned, The Hours of Decision, uh, where he talks about uh, non-white upheavals. White upheavals and non-white upheavals. 
where he talks about uh, the uh, demographic, yes, demographic in increase in non -European, among non-European peoples, and the demographic decrease of European peoples and their, uh, and their <clears throat> imminent uh, obituary, uh, self-obituary, so to say. But he does argue at some point that this is where he's... I don't know to in front of me. Give I have my problem. Need some time to find it on my <coughs> website. Where he actually talks, no, life is a fight. I'm not a pessimist. He says in a somewhat apologetic way, I'm not a pessimist. I keep fighting. Uh, life is a struggle. And uh, yeah, so he may sound a little bit more inspiring in his last book than in this first, in these two first volumes of the Decline of the West. So again, be careful when you when you. When you describe him as a cultural pessimist, well, he is in, in books and manuals, he is a, he describes cultural pessimist, but at the same time, he was a man full of energy, very, very Dionysian at some time. He liked smoking cigarettes as well. And uh, anyway, he liked well, drinking. Well, well, Tom, uh, it sounds like uh, he had a, actually was quite prophetic in, uh, in describing the post colonial. Uh, that came after the Second World War in India, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, as well as the civil rights movement in America. Um, do you think that if uh, Spengler, you know, was alive today, you know, if, if he had lived 130 years or something, do you think that, uh, uh, do you think in some sense that uh, a lot of his ideas have been vindicated, at least as delineated in the decline? Then, did you say pathetic or did you say prophetic? Prophetic, prophetic. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, it's a big difference, though. Thanks. No, I understand perfectly. Well, you're, you're reading my mind. Hence the need. Not This is not some of my wishful thinking or some of my sonic whim to talk about Spain. I hate to use the word prophecy and self-fulfilling prophecies because this has become a standard word now among many of our American politicians, Croatian politicians, you name it. We all think that they have some visionary, you know, and you know, and that they can change the world. I don't believe in it, but I would certainly very mildly use the word visionary, and as far as Spengler is concerned, hence the need, folks, indeed, to please the need to read the book. It's a short one; it has 100 pages. Read the book, The Hours of Decision. It's a short one. It will give you the synopsis of first of his first book, uh, which is quite complicated, which has uh, many, many footnotes uh, where he talks about different religions, uh, Catholicism, Islam. Yeah, I'm talking about the decline of the West. You know, It's a thick book. You know, it needs time. And uh, the book is interesting, the last one, because it's quite prophetic, or right, quite visionary, in the sense that he talked in the last chapter of it, he talks about this non-white revolution. I'm not sure he uses the word revolution itself, but he does talk about this as the as the people, energetic people. Quite, he doesn't make any value judgment, quite to the contrary. He doesn't make any, any statements whether this is good or bad. But he simply says that the West is totally, it's over. Because, and okay, folks, let me just back up a little bit. I know this is on the, on the tip of our tongue, and we don't want to say the word race, but we need to say that. Now, <clears throat> This is where uh, uh, Spengler differed from many of the contemporary racialist thinkers in Germany, uh, not just in National Socialist Germany, but even earlier to that. He was not a determinist, a racial determinist. He, was, he uses the word race, and, but he uses it in a broader sense, not in a biological sense. Only. He uses it all, uh, he distinguishes quite explicitly, folks, between strong races and weak races, but he doesn't say that the whites are any better than the, white, than the blacks, or for that matter, Asians, or what have you. So he was certainly not a, a racialist, he was certainly not a man who preached a racial exclusion, far from it. But still, he is aware of the fact that, uh, and this is one of the reasons why he was to some extent uh, steps, uh, um, uh, sidestepped and uh, uh, removed from the cultural uh, uh, strivings of early National Socialist regime, because he did not quite accept his racial determinism anyway. It's a long story. But at the same time, uh, he is aware, as a cultural pessimist, as somebody who is, doesn't have a very um, very rosy picture of the glorious, you know, the glorious West or the future of this glorious West, that uh, due to their, uh, to their uh, number, and due to the self-hate, yes, this is something also quite important in the book, which he mentions, 
I'm not sure he uses in the German language the word self-hate, but he talks about this pacifism. He talks about this guilt-ridden West. That's a good line, a good parallel we can draw with the, with the, with the United States of America and with the West. No, with the guilt-ridden pessimism resulting in, well, folks, we all equal. And he was a strong opponent of equality, folks. He was definitely a strong opponent of Marxism and of liberalism. And uh, he actually argues that once you start with those pontificating uh, self uh, uh, trip, kill, uh, trip feelings, then you are certainly seeing the terrain to stronger races, to more dynamic races, which will take over. And then uh, at some point, they will start rewriting the history. This is the main theme in this book, uh, uh, in both his books, but very well summarized, particularly in the last chapter of this book, the Hours of Decision, which again, I don't think it was very well translated. It should have been the title in German is The Years of Decision, but it's okay. It's all fine. Well, well uh, I got lost. I, got, I hope I'm not bothering you. Now. No, am I losing you? Are you? Am I? Am I, are you, am I whatever. No, that, that's fine. Let's, let's end this segment, uh, and in our next segment, we'll pick up the threads, and I want to talk about uh, the critical reception of both The Decline and his other works, uh, how Spengler has been viewed throughout uh, the last hundred or so years uh, and what his lasting legacy is. And we'll do that when we return. In this segment, Tom, I'd like to talk about uh, the legacy of Spengler, uh, both his uh, his works, uh, his, his, his death, and then in the last uh, almost eight decades since his death, how he has been viewed by critics, both pro and con, and how these things may have changed over the decades and what may be to come. So, uh, like you said, the book came out shortly after the First World War. How was it initially received uh, in Europe uh, and in other parts of the world? In Germany, it had a very uh, very positive. It became a standard reading for what came to be known later on <clears throat> cultural conservatives or young conservatives or nationalist conservatives is in, uh, in Germany. So usually uh, also Spingler's name is uh, in the same category with uh, novelist Ernst Jünger, who was also his colleague and who also, whose novels also have an imprint of a Spinglerian whiff of this end of the cultures, end of civilizations. Also, uh, why do I mention the words of uh, cultural conservatives in Germany, what they used to say, cultural, revolution, uh, cultural conservative revolution in Germany, which definitely had a certain impact 10 years later on the rise of national socialism in terms of uh, intellectual legitimacy. <clears throat> And yes, uh, so we cannot decouple the name of Oswald Spengler from the names of other, uh, uh, quote unquote, why do I use the word quote? Because it's today totally meaningless to say the word conservative. I don't know what it means, what, it, what does it mean, conservative? But, but at that time, yes, it was, uh, uh, Spengler's name was in the group, within the group of people like Ernst Jünger, the novelist, Carl Schmidt, the legal scholar, big legal scholar, very much translated now in English language all over the world. <clears throat> And then, of course, many other. Uh, Nietzsche was, of course, the uh, was a standard book that, that for all conservatives and many nationalists. There's no question about that. Now, <clears throat> again, one thing we need to mention is that his his book in French, to my knowledge, well, he really got me on that. I think it was translated in the late twenties in the French language, and it did have some impact over there. Now, keep in mind that. Uh, uh, also, Spengler in his book, the first book, The Decline of the West, quotes many, many similar, if I can say, similar French authors and scholars, sociologists. And uh, so the French were not that far behind. But he had definitely, the final word I need to say, he had definitely had a strong impact on the, on the legacy of cultural conservatism both in the United States of America, I'm talking prior to the Second World War, and uh, in, in, in the United States of America. Yes, in the United States, he was translated, I think, in 26 and 27, and the translation is very good. I can't tell you, there are a couple of tra different translators. Now, one thing, of course, uh, 
with the Second World War and with the aftermath of the Second World War, folks, <laughs> I'm sure you know what happened. And let's be perfectly uh, frank and open about uh, about Spengler and his legacy. Or for that matter, not just Spengler and his legacy, but uh, other similar authors, probably not of the same caliber, but of the similar caliber, both in France, in the United States of America, or for that matter, in, uh, in uh, Germany and elsewhere. Now, as far as other Spenglerians are concerned, Yoki, yes, Yoki is the first name that comes to my mind. I'm sure you read Yoki. He's uh, an American uh, young lawyer who was at this uh, Nuremberg trial, who, who died, I don't, who, who knows how. I'm not quite certain about the, about the, the all those intricacies about his death, but he was, his book on the Imperium, what, Imperium, yes, in English, was very much influenced by the Spenglerian legacy. Then uh, he had an impact on many conservative scholars that I already mentioned in the 50s and the 60s in the United States of America. But, and here's a big but, precisely because of, <clears throat> I can say, guys, and I hope I'm not sounding too, too biased, because of <clears throat> this um, leftist or left-leaning Marxian cultural hegemony sweeping over higher education, not just in Europe, but the United States of America, in the aftermath of the Second War. So this is like a different, it was not a war, but it was a different intellectual war. Uh, there is, it was to be expected that the uh, name of Spengler would be somewhat eclipsed and overshadowed by other authors. Uh, authors who became popular at Berkeley or Columbia, or for that matter, even where I studied in Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, were certainly not Spengler and uh, his likes, but rather Frankfurt teachers, scholars, Adorno, Horkheimer, and what have you. So we are having a gradual shift in uh, what we call, I hate this foreign word, paradigms, but that's exactly what happened. <clears throat> Students, including some of yourselves, folks who are now listening to me, were bombarded, literally, not metaphorically, by Nozick, by uh, Hannah Arendt, by uh, authors, Raymond Aron to some extent, in political science and sociology, in psychology as well, in psychoanalysis. <clears throat> Whereas the name of Spengler, he was not banned, far from it. No, it's certainly not in the United States of America. He was not even banned in, in, in Germany after the Second War, unlike, unlike hundreds of other scholars whose books were still not available in Germany and whose books even if you disseminate them openly, constitute a crime, an offense, a felony. You can't do that. You know, uh, Germany doesn't have a First Amendment. You know, you got to be careful what you say and how you say and, and which authors you quote. But it's a different ball game. We can talk some other time about this. So be it as it may, far from it that Spengler was forgotten. He was like a like a home. Uh, how can I say? Like a Larry or Pinaris. What do you call it? In, like a home ghost. Like a lively little home ghost protecting the household of every conservative scholar, every conservative uh, man, or even, even culturally pessimistic man inclined to, towards those speculation about the end of the West. And every, his name is, uh, everybody knows his name, even those people who never read him, <laughs> they know his name. He has a very nice style, there's no question, no dangling sentences, so I would suggest to you definitely to read him. He's a very, a very prolific author. And he's not, he doesn't want to, to fool you with some, with some locutions and some uh, words that uh, would be hard to grasp, unlike many, many conservative authors. So yes, he did not disappear, but he was not simply on the reading list. He was not in the syllabus of American and European uh, students, grad students in the, in the history department and sociology department and philosophy department. Even nowadays, if you go to any the University of Texas in Austin, for instance, you know, Dan can tell us about this. I'm pretty much sure if you talk to professors, they might probably mention his name every once in a while, but uh, there is hardly a course, uh, let's say a winter course or a summer course, or let's say a, a shortened, abbreviated course dealing with, uh, with the Spengler, uh, the meaning of Spengler for our modernity and post-modernity, something also important. So, uh, yes, I feel to some extent sore because I don't like this type of a selective, politically correct 
type of a reading list, which unfortunately we have a, all over Europe and, and in the United States of America. I'm sorry about the last portion of your question. I sort of got off the rail a little bit, yeah. so I sidetracked. So if you want to remind me about the second portion of your question, I'll be grateful. Yeah, well, yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to ask about, uh, uh, you know, uh, over the last uh, 80 years since his death, how he's been received. But it, it came to mind, uh, and for those people who are listening to this show, initially I had wanted to do a show about historians, and I wanted to do about Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire, Spengler, and uh, later Daniel J. Boston. But I was just looking up, and uh, another name came to me um, as someone uh, who may have written his work in direct response to Spengler. And would you think that Arnold Toynbee's uh, study of history was influenced by Spengler? And if so... Absolutely. I'm glad that you pointed this out. I must tell you, I remember partially some portions of Toynbee because probably I'm biased, too much biased towards Spengler. But yes, you cannot even imagine, I dare say this, you cannot imagine Toynbee without uh, Spengler's legacy. <clears throat> because even if chronologically, if you look at the time span, uh, one comes after the other. So there's no question that Toynbee has also worked, uh, uh, uses some of the, probably even better so, than, than, uh, than uh, Spengler. Now, again, you mentioned Gibbon. There's no question, even Gibbon is mentioned on several occasions in Spengler's book. So Gibbon is still considered as a prime author in st studying those cycles of history, which again, folks, is not purely a Spenglerian uh, phenomenon. This uh, cyclical concept of history, and I've been dealing with that for quite some time, both from the historical and also philosophical and religious perspective, this is something which is part and parcel of our ancient pre-Christian uh, pre legacy. You know? In ancient Europe, you know, uh, for that matter, look at the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans, uh, and this is where I'm fully in agreement with uh, Spengler, who was not a Christian. Of course, he was raised Christian, but he was not a Christian in a theological sense. He was a Nietzschean. He believed, and I guess I should have said that at the very beginning, he believed in this cyclical, this cyclical concept of history. Namely, uh, cultures grow, they, they become decadent, they, they disappear, but it's not the end of history. There is no such thing as a hunting... Um, I'm sorry. Uh, what is this a Japanese fellow what at the end of history who wrote uh, Fukushima. <laughs> yes <clears throat> yes there is no such thing uh, utterings he would consider that a crime an offense an academic offense even talking about the end of history so yes this is where Spengler and not just Spengler but Gibbon and Toynbee in like, along with many many authors uh, of the ancient uh, old uh, Greek times ancient Hellenic times and uh, including many, many cultural conservatives in a contemporary Europe and the United States, fully agree with, namely, that there is no such thing as the end of history. Uh, history has a certain chapter, it comes to an end, and Spengler is quite explicit about that. I should have probably used some different metaphors in, in, in explaining this uh, more succinctly. And, uh, and uh, even if let's say, hypothetically speaking, if the whites, even if they all disappear from the map or from the land, from the earth, it doesn't mean it's going to be the end of life. It's just the beginning of a different cycle of history. And uh, I guess to this extent, we must, uh, again, praise, if I can put it that way, the Spengler and his uh, definite uh, inroads in the study of the philosophy of history. Now, again, folks, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that we got to be careful about the uh, right uh, usage of locutions. Uh, uh, Spengler is not a historian. He's not recording history. He's not descriptive in, in, his, uh, in his, his historical accounts. Yes, to some extent he is, but he's basically a philosopher of history. Philosopher of history. So I would definitely uh, uh, describe him first and foremost as a philosopher before I describe him as a historian. And uh, yes, uh, uh, he's, I'm not ruling out that he may again gain in credibility or in popularity in the years to come, depending again on who is going to be doing the PR and the footwork on his behalf and who's going to be preventing those things. Now, I know that there are a couple of um, racialists and a couple of white nationalists, whatever they call themselves, who may be a little bit offended by his not explicit statement of uh, white race as the main standard barrier of, of, of uh, let's say, progress or something. 
But again, you'd be surprised he doesn't uh, doesn't laud or for that it doesn't matter. He doesn't race to the skies uh, neither race, and he's a uh, I must say he's very neutral and very objective in, in this sense. What we need to say, however, why I like personally on a personal level why I like Spengler, because he's very critical not just of Bolshevism and communism, but he's also critical of liberalism. And one thing, yes, Dan, I forget the main thing, the most important thread in our Spenglerian discussion. And this is what? The criticism, sharp criticism, sharp, immense criticism of progress. This is Fortschritt. In German language, it's Fortschritt. He hated Fortschritt. The concept, this philosophical concept of Fortschritt being associated with, uh, with Marxism and Leninism and liberalism nowadays, of course, and we constantly talk about more, more, uh, more income, more, 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 what, more wealth, more greed, and this. He actually rejects it wholeheartedly. It doesn't exist for him. This is the major, the major, the main and the major uh, vector of decadence and of, of self-destruction, for sure. And I'm glad, yes, we can draw the parallel with Christopher Lush. Yes, he's definitely Spenglerian. Read Christopher Lush. He's a great American. Well, he died just like Spengler. He was 56 or 57. I think he died in 94, Christopher Lush, great American scholar of German ancestry. <clears throat> He wrote some very visionary, path-breaking books about the sculpture of narcissism, very pessimistic books, very much influenced by Spengler. I can tell you that for sure. I think he mentions him on several occasions, but, he, but he, you can see definitely this uh, well, the whiff of Spengler in all of his books. Well, Tom, and Tom, he, Tom, yeah, Tom yeah, if I can... He if I... actually rejects virtue, this progress, the ideology of progress. Well, when you say the ideology of progress, you're talking uh, about in terms of comparative cultural superiority, aren't you? I mean, obviously he accepted that science would advance and, you know, I mean, if if he had seen uh, Neil Armstrong walk on the moon or, you know, our flyby with a satellite near the planet Pluto recently, I mean, certainly he would note that as progress. I, you're, what you're really talking is about culturally comparative progress. Is, is that not correct? Yes, well, I'm glad that you brought this up because this is something very important. I myself, just like Christopher Lush, or let's say like Spengler, I'm definitely against this ideology of progress. Having said this, folks, it doesn't mean that we have to return to the trees and we have to use the, uh, the, uh, the closets, the restrooms, like, uh, I don't know, like people in some parts of... Uh, of, of of um, whatever in Saudi Arabia or wherever or in, in, in Africa. We certainly, I'm certainly not <laughs> opposed to the helicopters and to choppers and to different electronic devices uh, coming to on the material progress. It's just the ideology of progress which actually overwhelms our spiritual endeavors, our, our intellectual endeavors. And actually, he traces uh, 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 Spengler. He traces this uh, this uh, destructive uh, ideology of progress back to the Enlightenment, which had its good sides, both in the United States of America and United and France, uh, but it, which also had its very ugly sides. Namely, it has it has made people uh, believe it actually turned into a religion. The religion we can better say it's somewhat sarcastic. It's a religion of progress. When you believe that everything can be solved by a stroke of the pen by a guy from, a, let's say, the European Commission or my, my Oval Office, and that some 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 whatever the current economic crisis can be uh, subdued by some gurus from the Wall Street, this is the ideology of progress, and this is the false assumption, a very dangerous assumption, and this is why we need to return and here. I'm a good advocate for Spain. That's why we need to return to Spenglerian vision of, of this cyclical history. Because once we accept this quote-unquote cultural pessimism, once we accept this, uh, this idea, this phenomenon, that we are all just, you know, a transitory beings here, and something we, we need to leave something after us, there's no question of it, not just consume, 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 then of course this will help us subdue uh, pessimism or civil wars or uh, impending chaos. And this is exactly what Spengler says in a more explicit manner. So I guess I'm trying just to compound and synthesis as much as I can, Spengler. But he's not the only one. Many, especially many what they call what I call conservative, uh, uh, cultural conservatives are opposed to this phenomenon, this religion of progress, whereby we all assume, especially now media, that uh, there's some there's a magic wand that will be 
uh, discovered next year in, a, in the Oval Office or somewhere, who knows, in the Fed, and that uh, uh, whatever quantitative easing will be <laughs> uh, able to uh, facilitate our, our, our uh, how can I say, our trans transition to a glorious future, glorious society where everybody will be happy and everybody will, and where everybody will enjoy 24 hours uh, fun. This is, this is something where I'm fully in agreement with Spain. Namely, folks, what we have now, the food that I have on the table, the money that I have on the table or whatever, it certainly can collapse any minute and we have to be prepared for that. This is the main line of Oswald Spengler. He was against false utopianism then. Absolutely. That's even a better word. He was against utopianism. In other words, the utopianism, be it in its uh, Marxist modality, or call it the Bolshevik modality, we know how it ended up in 91, and now we see the liberal modality. And he was, by the by, folks, he's very, very critical of America, not just per se, not as such America, but as the American ruling elites, the ruling class of the United States of America, and he was very, very critical of liberalism, capitalism. He uses the word plutocracy quite often, plutocracy, money, greed, and he also, he talks, I mean, very, very, I think, hundreds of times at least he uses in his books, plutocracy. It was a very popular term in, in Europe in the 30s, plutocracy, you know, the, land, the rule of the rich. And the, yeah. Well, Tom, and the let, me, let me ask, as we're, tape, as we're recording this uh, interview, it's the year 2015, so who knows, five, ten years from now, someone's watching it. It's been almost 80 years, eight decades since uh, the death of Spengler. If we project outwards uh, in another eight years, can you tell me where uh, uh, academic or cultural uh, ideas about Spengler are now and where you think they may be as we head towards uh, the end of the 21st century? Well, I guess there are two things we need to single out. In the, his latest book that I, that I mentioned already, the Hours of Decision, it talks about this non-white revolution. So your question to a large extent depends on the following answer. We'll have the answer, the clear-cut answer more or less, uh, or at least the, the, the visible answer, based on the, on, the, on the social and ethnic profile of the United States of America and uh, Europe in the 10 years down the road. I'm sure you're aware of the fact, and Spengler wasn't aware of that because there's always this unpredictable factor in history. He wasn't aware of the fact in the, when he died in 36 that uh, first that Germany was going to be end up in a chaotic, self-destructive war. And secondly, that 30 years, or rather 50 years after his death, that you're a million non-European residents and peoples. And it's social and demographic fabric is changing on the daily basis. So again, 10 years down the road, I don't know where I'm going to be sitting at. I don't know how, how my judgments will be and, uh, on, on Spengler and his prophecies and his visions. But I suspect that if his Spengler was alive now, this, that he would be extremely concerned with the ultimate decadence of the West. And again, uh, look, you, let me tell you one thing and on an ethno ethnocentric level, if I may. I think I, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but we have to say that it's a different ballgame when a, let's say, um, a white scholar or let's say a German scholar de defines Spengler than let's say a non-white scholar. So I'm pretty much sure there may be, there may be some differences in uh, objective uh, value, in objective uh, assessment of uh, Spengler's work. Because the perspectives, and this is by the by, folks, also quite important because so Spengler doesn't talk about the global history as such. He talks about those micro-histories. He says, yes, the decline of the West is, is, uh, shows that, as the French said, it's, 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 it's obituary, it's, it's final. But it doesn't mean that some other cultures, like specifically the Chinese culture, may be springing up in the, in a, may be in the wings in the, in the years and the decades to come, which I'm quite certain of. This may be, uh, this may be the case with, uh, with the world, with the planet, in, uh, in 10 years down the road, with the Chinese. But again, where I may disagree, and I'm happy about this with Spengler, and where I may sound a little bit optimistic, and where I'm in agreement with some other historians, some good friends and colleagues of mine, namely, is that there's always the unpredictable factor in history. I know it firsthand. In 1991, no, in 1990, nobody could have predicted the, 
uh, following uh, the, the, the breakdown of communism in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, which I witnessed firsthand. And uh, nobody could have predicted 10 years ago that you know, the fall of Saddam or whatever, um, uh, Libyan Gaddafi, but folks, if I now start speculating about what's going to be in Europe, uh, what's going to be in America 10 years down the road, I guess I don't want to sound too far-fetched and probably too crazy. So I guess I do have some ideas. I'm not very optimistic about the United States of America and the future of um, growth, or what they call it, and religion of growth in the United States of America. So I hate to end up on this tone and uh, on this level, folks, but I can definitely suggest you please do reach Pingler. If you don't like all of his stuff, at least read some chapters that may be more digestible for you. One thing I can for, for sure tell you is his lingo, his uh, syntax is quite simple, so you won't have a hard time with it. A couple of foreign words that you may be, become familiar with because now we use the word totalitarianism, which was not a, not a word in the 30s, was not in usage. He uses the word Caesarism for authoritarian dictatorships, which he was quite in favor of, depending on the country. And again, he was quite in favor of Mussolini, rise to Poland to some extent. Uh, strong men are sometimes needed in order to prevent the chaos. And there are words, but most of the words are uh, well translated into English, so I don't think you'll have some hard time. Unless you guys, you're, 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 you're really crazy about semantic levels as I am. But I'm glad that we have covered a little bit Spengler. And I hope we'll have some more Spenglerians. Yes, on the conservative horizon, there are lots of um, conservatives in America, young conservatives, who quote him quite often, often in a self-serving fashion, if that's always the case. And uh, uh, I hope he will I hope he will become a mainstream reading in our, on the college level. Well, Tom, let's end this segment. And uh, when we get back, uh, let's uh, wrap up the interview. I want to talk a little bit about a couple of uh, other things that you had sent me and also give you a final uh, say. So we'll do that in a moment. Well, I want to wrap up this interview uh, and give Tom uh, a few minutes to just uh, summarize uh, some of his uh, views. Uh, but uh, before we do that, uh, a few weeks back, uh, Tom, you had sent me an email from uh, a website uh, or, or a paper called the Occidental Observer, uh, an article called The Surveillance Society and Freedom Curbing Legislation on Nothing New. Uh, and in looking over it, uh, you know, it, it has uh, a lot to do with uh, certainly uh, what's happened in America post uh, 9-11. Uh, what are your views about uh, about that, and how does it relate to Spengler? Well, first about the Occidental Observer, I frequently write and I submit my pieces for the Occidental Observer, and as editor-in-chief is Professor Kevin MacDonald. I'm sure folks are familiar with his name. He's world-known. He's been translated in different languages, and I usually translate some pieces and pieces by my colleague, my good colleague, Alain de Benoit. By the by, Alain de Benoit is one of the most prominent Spenglerian philosopher, under quotation marks, of course. He's not obsessed with Spengler, he's not deterministic in all ways like Spengler was. But Alain de Benoit certainly knows all nooks and crannies about Spengler, probably better than I do. He has written extensively about Spengler, heavily footnoted books, so you may want to look at his, uh, his books and his approach. Now, as far as the specific piece is concerned on the uh, surveillance society, this is also a theme that I've been dealing with for quite some time. And this is an interview Alain de Benoit gave in French to a journal recently, and I translated it into English, as I often do for the Occidental Observer with some other of his pieces. What is the main theme, folks? Well, you know, we are being under surveillance. It's no big deal. We know that for sure. With radar cameras, cameras or radars or cameras on every street corner, or for that matter, you know, this... Uh, hidden cameras that you don't need. You know, sometimes I get a little bit embarrassed because even when I use the public restrooms, you never know if somebody is not just listening to you, but watching you, which is maybe even more serious than that. Anyway, and um, I guess, uh, why is this piece important and why is this theme important, folks? Because, you know, we, we sort of grew up with Orwell and with this uh, freedom uh, surveying, uh, with this surveillance society as described by George Orwell and a big brother. But again, 
uh, we, we have long uh, surpassed this, this Orwellian type of imagery. We are now in a system which is far more uh, uh, intrusive. Into a, and I, I frankly, I, you know, I, I can take a wild guess, but even when I'm now talking to you, I'm, I, you know, I'm not that paranoid. But I guess if somebody is really interested in, in uh, hearing what I have to say, is that uh, I can always find it out. And I like this expression by Alan de Bernard, which I translated into English. Uh, the ruling class doesn't want to... Uh, the, the people often... I'm just trying to paraphrase. The, the people often complain how they are not being heard. Well, at least they are being listened to. <laughs> so I guess it's a good pun that Alan de Bernard makes in his... In his uh, piece that I translated. So yes, folks, uh, it does remind me to some extent of the communist system which I lived. And again, I would, from my perspective, I'm not so much concerned with the surveillance systems. I guess, you know, America still, despite, you know, some different laws that have passed recently, still has the First Amendment. In many instances, it still has a margin of maneuvering, intellectual maneuvering, of course, more than any other country on earth. However, what I'm concerned with, and this brings me again to the Spenglerian category, folks, is self-surveillance, is self-censorship, particularly in academia. I don't want to sound too pamphletic now, or too, how do I say, too pathetic. It's too pathetic and too subjective. But yes, one of the reasons I'm here, one of the reasons I'm frustrated is because of this self-serving and also self-censoring environment in American and in European academia, where people are far more concerned with our pension funds than in uh, conveying our uh, <clears throat> right, decent messages and knowledge to their, to the people that they've been entrusted with, the young students. And I guess this is what I consider a major, really a major intellectual crime. The folks, especially professors, academics, who instead of serving as role models, as a good examples for the society, have become so scared to the extent that they write things just because they're well paid. I mean, it just doesn't only apply to academics, it applies to politicians. But then again, this brings us into an entirely different realm of analysis, which I hope one of these days I'll be able to talk about with Dan in more, in more detail. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, uh, I'm involved in the arts and have been so for 30 years in the U.S. And uh, I've always been critical of academia, especially in the arts. Uh, the old saying that those who can and do the can and teach is especially applicable in the arts. And uh, you have to you have to go to college uh, uh, to to learn to be an ethical or moral citizen. Well, you don't go to a university to learn to be moral, you go to a university to debate ethics. Uh, you know, if, if you have to rely on a professor to teach you what's right and wrong, you, you're missing the whole point. I, there's too much of a focus on people's emotions and feelings rather than their intellect. For, because to me, what defines us as human beings, as opposed to uh, ape-like ancestors, is that we have minds. It's not our emotions. I, I'm a pet lover. I, I own, I've had cats for many years. My cats can feel love, but they can't cogitate. And so I, I, I agree with that, that there's, uh, there's been a, a diminution uh, in, in West European and, and America, especially, of the intellectual content and, and actually debating things. Too often when you get people with opposing points of view, someone takes offense very easily and they use that emotional offense as a, a weapon in the argument. So I think, I think I'm in agreement with uh, your and your colleague's point of view. But let me just uh, end up, uh, uh, let, let's end up, let, let you just give you a couple, two, three, four minutes, whatever you want. Uh, if you just want a summary statement about uh, Spengler or his views or anything. Yes, in terms of methodology, folks, I don't know if this is the right word because it's being used so often to the extent that it's become meaningless. But okay, let's, in terms of academic approach, in terms of scholarly approach, in, ter in terms of, let's say, just educational approach, a simple word. I think, uh, folks, uh, when you study Spengler, please, as I mentioned earlier, uh, try to find an uh, author of a similar background, of a similar approach and a similar content, it will facilitate you the reading and the understanding of Spengler himself. And at the same time, it will be, you will be able, it will facilitate your understanding the broader perspective. 
I, I always I, I like I love using the word perspective. I always like to put myself in perspective, not just the people and my interlocutors like Dan I'm talking to. I'm also trying to, to observe myself with his eyes, and this is why Spengler can be also helpful to you, not just by reading him single uh, what's the right word single handedly what's the in a, in a separate fashion in a in a uh, in an extrapolated fashion try to find try to lump him yeah, that's a good lump him together with similar authors and yes again if, if I can be of any assistance do write to me I wrote a piece on Spengler culture culture and decadence in Spengler I almost forgot the title in a rather prestigious journal uh, Clio in 1994, or 1991, oh, wow, I was a professor at Cal State Fullerton back then, so the piece was published, it's very well, it has a solid bibliography in German, English, and French, on um, quoting many Spenglerians, and I guess I, I, this morning I was rereading the piece of mine after so many, long, many times, many years, and I, I don't think I disagree with anything that I previously said. I would probably sound a little bit even more pessimistic than before because the actual situation nowadays in Europe, but also in the States, especially with the rise of the masses and the minds of the... I don't blame them. Far from it that I blame the, those newcomers coming from the different parts of the world. I rather blame the plutocratic elites and the capitalist elites that have enabled without false preaching about equality, about the quick success about, the, about the becoming very rich in Germany or in Austria and Croatia overnight. Of course, those poor guys who come from Somalia, Somalia, Ethiopia, and from Algeria, what do you expect them to, to think about? They think really that they can have just nice chicks around and they will strike it rich overnight. So the local white elites, corrupted elites, again, that Spengler was writing about, the plutocrats, they are the ones who actually bear the blame. They are the ones who actually should are responsible for this chaotic situation in, in, in Europe and the United States of America. I'm using those words and lumping them together because once upon a time you could tell the difference between Europe and, 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 and the States, but now in terms of societal, politics, economy, you name it guys, arts, everything, I, I really can't tell the difference. The portions of Zagreb where I live right now, and literally you can't tell the difference between, let's say, Ar Anaheim or, let's say, some parts in Cleveland or, 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 or Zagreb. Of course, there's a nice cathedral and people, of course, we can say there's, it's more European, definitely, but um, in the sense that uh, in terms of demographic profile, but uh, this, this fun society, this consumer society, this obsession with greed, this self-serving, this lingo, this particularly, what do you call it, this lingo in the media, it reminds me very much of the lingo of um, uh, U.S. or European scribes or would-be journalists or academics. So yes, I'm, I'm quite disappointed with the intellectual environment, both in the Europe, both in Europe and the United States of America. Well, thanks for your time, Tom, uh, in talking so in depth about uh, the life and career and uh, legacy of Oswald Spengler, one of the uh, bigger name and uh, I think one of the more interesting historians. Uh, of uh, the past. Uh, for those who have enjoyed my conversation with Tom Sunik, you can look below this video and you will see a link to his own website, tomsunik.com, if you want to have any more information about his writings or if you want to contact him. Uh, and in the next couple of weeks, I will be having a show on uh, the history of certain comic books. And then after that, I will be talking with four people who have alternate ideas about the history and the start of the universe. So that's a, a bit of a, a, a switch from what we have today. But again, Tom, thank you for your time. Thank you.